Good evening, everyone. Welcome to LUMCON Science Talks. I'm Over. I'm the Associate Director of Education and Outreach for LUMCON, and I am so glad that you could join us this evening. Um, one thing that I would like to have you guys do, everybody should have access to a question function in their dashboard. Um, that is how you're going to engage with the speaker and me. Um, and so we just like to have you guys test that question function. So if you don't mind, use that question um, function to say hi or answer that food for thought question that I sent you as you logged in um, or whatever. Uh, so let us know that you're out there by using that question box. Hello, Michelle from Connecticut. So glad you can join us. Thank you. Hi, Robert. <laughs> Your test is received, Frederick. Wow, you guys are great with that question function. Hi, Elizabeth. <gasps> Robbie from Bermuda. Hello from Boston. I see we got some fans out there for you. <laughs> Does anybody want to take a stab at that question? A robot that likes eating noodles. Yeah, what do we call that? Any guesses? It's a ramenator. Ramenator. <laughs> Sorry, I always get the best kicks out of those. All right. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Uh, you make it difficult to follow, Mert, um, I have to say. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of Science at LUMCON. Um, <clears throat> and I'm still <laughs> cracking up here. Uh, I apologize for, for that. Um, uh, it's my privilege to get to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Dana Yerger is a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, and a researcher in marine robotics. Uh, for those of you who have not been to Woods Hole, it's a fantastic place to, to do science. I actually got to do my master's degree and worked in Woods Hole at the Marine Biological Lab down the road uh, for several years, more years ago than I would like to remember. Um, <clears throat> but <laughs> Dr. Jurger is uh, supervises the research and academic programs of graduate students studying oceanographic engineering through the MIT HUI joint program in the areas of control, robotics, and design. Um, he's been a key contributor to many different um, remotely operated uh, vehicles and robots. You'll hear some about that today. Um, he's gone on to sea in over 80 oceanographic expeditions. Um, he's got a very distinguished uh, record, but I want to make sure that I give time for him to actually talk to you this evening. Uh, I will point out just a couple of highlights. He was the 2009 recipient of the Lockheed Award for Ocean Science and Engineering and serves on the research board of BP's uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Um, he recently served as the interim director of HUI's Center for Marine Robotics and recently held the Walter A. and Hope Noyes uh, Smith Chair for Excellence in Oceanography. He was elected a fellow of the IEEE, -E -E, or that's one extra E, I apologize, there's only three of them, <laughs> in 2021 for the development of autonomous underwater vehicles for deep ocean exploration and science. And I just want to turn it over to you because we're really excited to hear your talk. Um, thank you very much for joining us and thank all of you in attendance for uh, tuning in this evening. All righty, well, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, and I'm gonna show my screen and we hope that works. Are we good, Mark? It looks okay. great. Great, all righty. So we're gonna talk about exploring the midwater ocean uh, with robots. We'll talk a little bit about robots in general uh, and uh, we'll talk about the midwater and why we think it's such an amazing place and why we need uh, a new generation of robotics to explore it. Um, oops, I'm not uh, advancing my slide here. Uh, here we go. Thought we practice all this. There we go. Okay, well, when we talk about the midwater ocean, or we, oh, we, we nickname it the twilight zone, okay, it extends from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters depth. 
Um, so that might seem kind of arbitrary to you, but in fact, we define that because that's the range of depth in the ocean where it's too deep for photosynthesis, which means there's not enough sunlight for, for green plants to grow, but there's some measurable light from the sun. So beneath about a thousand meters, it's really hard for us to even count the photons. Um, and at 200 meters, uh, even at noontime, there isn't enough light for, for uh, green plants to thrive. But nevertheless, even though there's no uh, primary production there, um, it is home to abundant animal life staggering, in staggering amounts, actually. And it likely plays an important role in regulating climate. We'll talk briefly about it because it, it's a, it's a uh, through the twilight zone, uh, a lot of carbon most likely gets sequestered, but we don't necessarily have a good handle on those numbers, and they're very important. Okay. Uh, one very important feature about the Twilight Zone um, is that many animals that live there undergo what we call dial vertical migration, DVM. What that means is they spend the daylight hours uh, deep in the ocean, uh, in the, the deep dark ocean, where presumably they're safe, safer from predators. But then in the evening, they rise to the surface to feed on the richer waters actually above the Twilight Zone, where the life is much richer because that's where photosynthesis can happen. And then at dawn, they descend back down uh, to the depths. And this is many, many hundreds of meters. So typically they'll be between zero and hundred meters um, in the evening uh, or even at the surface. Uh, and during the day, they'll be hundreds of meters deep, 500, maybe even a thousand meters. Okay, uh, unquestionably, this is the largest migration on earth. It's happening all the time. You know, the animals are going up uh, where the sun is setting and they're going down uh, where the sun is rising. So that's always happening all the time, all around the world. Um, so it, it's massive. Um, and it probably plays a major role in sequestering carbon, as I said before. Now, I'm not going to linger on this diagram because it's it's kind of busy. But basically, you know, the, the, the phytoplankton, the, the plant life near the surface, um, uh, absorbs uh, carbon up from the CO2 that was most recently in the atmosphere, okay? And then uh, through any number of mechanisms, that carbon can end up getting uh, sequestered into the deep ocean, okay? Which is a good thing if you're uh, hoping that the CO2 levels in the atmosphere uh, stay where they are. So the ocean is a, essentially a big buffer that's preventing the atmospheric CO2 from rising faster than it is now, okay? But these mechanisms where the carbon goes from the shallow to the deep, um, uh, it's extremely complicated. There's a lot of different pathways. And uh, and uh, my, my friends who are chemists and biologists and whatnot are trying to unravel a lot of that. And so a lot of our technology that we're developing is being built to help quantify that. Um, and well, a simple way that the carbon can go down is that the animals can feed at near the surface at night, and then when they go down deep in the ocean, um, you, know, you know what's gonna happen next after a big meal. Well, that's what's gonna happen, um, and it's gonna happen down deep. So that is literally a mechanism for transporting carbon. This is actually a big term in any global climate model, and it's pretty uncertain right now. So. Okay, let's talk a little bit about robots. Um, watch the time here. Um, uh, we have lots of different kinds of robots and some of them have evolved over time. Uh, the, it, when I first started in this field in the 70s, uh, they were curiosities. I mean, we had some other systems for exploring this, the seafloor and the midwater. Um, but it, I think over in, in the 90s, robots really came into, into their own and now they're absolutely mainstays for science exploration, the seafloor, the midwater, whatever. And you, you see a number of different shapes and sizes here, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those. The one in the upper left-hand corner is one of my favorites. That was that was called Abe, and it was the first autonomous vehicle that we, uh, th that we built, and we had some fantastic success with it, um, and uh, uh, until it was finally lost, sadly. Um, and then the Mesobot, which I'll be talking about today, is actually down in the lower uh, right-hand corner. 
Okay, well, first of all, what do we mean by a marine robot? There's a lot of people that have different ideas about what they really are. Um, this is sort of one of my takes, we're borrowing uh, someone else's figure here from uh, Zoo, from Science Robotics. Um, you know, some of them are, some robots are built along fairly conventional marine engineering. You know, they have prope uh, principles, they have propellers and they have, you know, buoyancy and they have batteries and whatever. Um, uh, and those are the kinds that I make, frankly. Um, but there are some more fanciful uh, ideas out there that we can make ro robots that, that swim like fish or like a uh, squid or um, like a manta ray or whatever. And there's a lot of people who are trying to work on that. Um, and that, that's some very interesting stuff. So, but in my mind, you know, let's talk about what a robot needs to do. It, it's going to be automated. It's going to have some intelligence and it's going to be autonomous probably some of the time. It's going to be mobile. Okay. Otherwise, it's not. It's a sensor, maybe, maybe a very useful sensor, but it's not really a robot. Um, but in, and that robot can carry important sensors. I mean, that's why. We're, that's the first thing that a, a robot is doing, making measurements. Um, uh, it might take samples. Uh, it's generally has some sense of where it is. Okay, that's kind of important. And of course, uh, when we work in the marine environment, we learn important lessons about robots. So. I think that uh, a lot of the lessons from marine robotics carry into the larger uh, robotic sphere. Um, and of course, we learn a lot more about the marine environment. So um, robots contribute to both general knowledge about robots and also to oceanography. Um, jumping around my career a little bit, um, I was through, uh, uh, I was uh, on the expedition back in 1985 where we used, I, I hesitate to call it a robot. It's up here in the upper, uh, left-hand corner is, uh, oh, I can, can people see my cursor? I hope so. Um, uh, this is the Argo tow sled. That's what we used to find the Titanic. And it was lowered from the ship on a cable. Uh, and that cable um, had a single uh, conductive element in it, uh, actually two. It was a, had a coaxial cable. Uh, and we could get one scratchy TV picture up to the surface. Um, and uh, by towing that in a very disciplined um, way, of course, uh, the leader of our expedition was Dr. Robert Ballard uh, and uh, Mr. Jean-Louis Michel from the French uh, Ephemer Agency. Uh, and they had a search strategy and we were able to execute that strategy and find the, uh, the ship. Um, not really a robot, but it, we were building towards making robots. Um, uh, of course, we got some great pictures. The first thing we found was one of the Titanic spoilers. Well, the first thing that we recognized. So before we found the ship, we were in the debris field and we spotted this boiler. That was kind of cool. But the, the real time picture wasn't quite as good. You see down in the lower left. And here's a bunch of us celebrating on the lower right. And that's including me. Um, I'm a bit uh, slimmer in that picture and I have a lot more hair. Um, anyway, uh, so that was a great moment that I'll always remember. And that was sort of one of the bridge technologies that got us to the kind of robots that we have today. We actually did a lot of different shipwreck surveys over the years. Uh, uh, historical shipwrecks. This is uh, the oops. Uh, the top uh, right one is the Hamilton Scourge, which is in uh, Lake Ontario. Uh, we we with uh, working with Ballard, uh, we did a lot of work uh, uh, discovering and mapping um, uh, ancient ships on the seafloor in the Mediterranean. And we also did uh, ship forensic work. Okay, and that's where there's been a marine accident, a tragedy, of course. Um, and we go in and investigate the wreckage, uh, sort of like they do after a plane crash, okay? And we help people like the NTSB or their equivalent in other countries put the story together of how the ship was lost. And the one that we worked on most recently was the El Faro, which tragically was lost in a hurricane uh, on its way from Florida to Puerto Rico uh, in about 5,000 meters of water. So that was a very challenging uh, expedition. And the, the Derbyshire, shown here in the lower, uh, left was also in um, about 5,000 meters of water, so very deep. Um, we, we worked on remotely operated vehicles for a while, and these were, are used sometimes in the water. They're mostly used on the seafloor. Uh, we have one at Woods Hole called Jason, which is still operating, uh, and we've used that for a lot of seafloor studies over the years. I think Jason's dive count is way in the thousands. I'm not sure what it is, uh, five or 6,000, something like that dives that it's done over the years. Um, 
Uh, and then I've been working for many, also I worked on autonomous vehicles like this Sentry vehicle you see here. And its product was typically very fine scale maps of the seafloor. This is the base of an underwater volcano uh, off the coast of New Zealand. Um, uh, and we, but we also used it for some other opportunistic things. Here we were mapping the deep plume that came off the deep water horizon, uh, some of the hydrocarbons that were trapped in the ocean. And we were able to make a map of that kind of river of hydrocarbons. It's, that's a, I don't mean to use hyperbole because it was quite dilute, but it was also very real and we could measure it. Uh, unlike what was going on on the surface, this was about a thousand meters deep in the ocean. Um, so we've used those kind of vehicles for a lot of things. But let's talk about Mesobot here. Um, uh, here we see, uh, and the inspiration for this was um, Dr. Larry Maiden, who is a biologist at Hui and vice president for research and a pioneer in blue water scuba. He challenged uh, me and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Annette Govindarajan, you'll hear a little bit about her later, um, uh, that to see if uh, I could build a robot that could show him what he missed when he ran out of air. And I had never really thought about making a robot for midwater studies before that. So that inspiration uh, is what led to the Mesobot. And so we started doing, you know, raising money and figuring out the idea and recruiting collaborators. And um, that was uh, about seven or eight years ago. And now we have an operational vehicle. It takes a long time to make these things happen, especially when it's a new kind of thing. Uh, so, um, anyway, um, uh, okay, so what is a Mesobot? Okay, we sort of take the skins off here, and, and I can say the, um, uh, so it has the cameras. Okay, oops, sorry, I'm, I'm pointing things out on the wrong screen. Here we go. Um, so, uh, it carries cameras, it has a stereo pair, that'll be important, and it has a, a pretty nice, what we call a science camera. So this is really the business end of the vehicle. Another business thing is our sampler down here that we use uh, to uh, sample environmental DNA. Okay, so this is, and, and then there's other sensors on the vehicle too, we'll talk about uh, it's radiometer, some other things. Um, so that's really the things that return scientific product to us, either images or scalar data, like uh, the, the level of the uh, sunlight or, um, or, or actual physical samples of uh, environmental DNA. Okay, um, it has six thrusters and these are pretty low powered thrusters. So you might say, why are they so big? They're so big because we like to have big slow turning propellers um, so that we don't disturb the water very much. So these are actually pretty wimpy thrusters and these blades turn very slowly. And that's because we don't wanna disturb these delicate uh, animals uh, while we're imaging. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I have to point out, this was a collaborative effort. Uh, you see our partners here, Mbari and Stanford uh, and uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. They're very indebted to my collaborators for, for that. And uh, we have a little um, video here showing it going together. And there, are you seeing some of the engineers that uh, work on Mesobot with me. This is us learning to uh, track uh, things. And of course, we're gonna chase the migration. Uh, and here's Mesobot actually following an animal, uh, in this case, a jellyfish. All righty, I think I'm gonna end the video there. Okay, so um, so we actually had a paper in Science Robotics uh, recently, uh, and uh, that that talked about that work and how we actually did did that. And I already showed the tracking video, so I guess I should have cut that slide out. So what are we doing now? We're we're making that tracking better, okay? Um, and we've added some other key instruments to the Mesobot. Oops, I'm using the pointer in the wrong thing. And those are specifically the eDNA sampling, and we'll talk about that. Um, and also uh, radiometers, which are very important um, instruments, essentially light meters, but they're light meters that can measure the extremely, extremely dim light, which is 
the biologically relevant levels of light, which where the animals like to live. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about the uh, multi-sampler. Uh, the device itself was built by my collaborator, Alan Adams, who also built the uh, radiometers, by the way. Uh, he's a, a fantastic uh, collaborator. Um, and uh, he used to study black holes and string theory in the physics department at MIT until he um, uh, decided to join people like me and explore the ocean. Uh, Annette Kovindarajan is our other collaborator, and she handles all the experimental design uh, of the eDNA, and of course she processes all the, the samples and does all the analysis to actually um, get the biodiversity um, results that are why we're doing environmental DNA. Just in case you don't know what that means, if you take seawater and you filter it, you extract DNA from uh, what's on the filter, uh, you'll be getting uh, free-floating DNA from, of, from animals that were present there. They were present there at some time, um, or they were present somewhere nearby and the DNA came that way. There's a lot of issues about what that actually means. But of course, then you can um, you can um, amplify that DNA, and then you can sequence it, and you can learn a tremendous amount about what's there, even though you haven't seen those animals and you haven't caught them in a net. So it's very important. So um, here's this wonderful sampler that Alan Adams built for us. Each we carry three of these 16 packs on Mesobot, and these blue cylinders are the filters that 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 snap in. Uh, and then there's 16 pumps and flow meters in here. So we can we can pump the water through the filter, we can measure the flow, um, and then we can snap the filters off. They, they pull the actual physical filter out of the filter holder. They put it in the minus 80 freezer, um, and it comes back to its hole, and then they do the extraction of the DNA, and then they, they, they sequence it, and then they uh, process all the wonderful results. Um, so, uh, and here you see it going over the side. The, the, so you see those cylinders. Here they are. Uh, oops, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm pointing on the wrong screen. So, um, so here's the. There's three 16 packs here, and you can see them underneath the mesobot there. You can also see mesobot's radiometer. We're going to talk about that next. Okay. Um, uh, here's the, actually an experiment that we did last year uh, on the RV Nautilus, and this is kind of complicated, but uh, these, these sonar images give you a kind of profile through the ocean, okay, of, of, of what kind of animal life is there. And you see this, you see this diagonal line there. Those are the migrating animals. They're coming up from deep in the ocean and they're coming in to join this surface layer, okay? And that sonar is telling us that story, okay? It's fantastic. So while that was going on, um, I'm just going to walk you through these four graphs quickly. And I can talk to anybody later about this in more detail. Here's what the light that we measured on the surface was. So we're doing this at sunset. It's going from pretty bright to pitch dark, okay? Um, and here's the light measurement actually at the vehicle from Alan Adams' wonderful radiometer. And we see that uh, the light is fairly constant. Um, uh, and then it gets, it gets dimmer, and then now at this point, we're pretty much at the noise floor of the sensor. Um, and I, well, actually, I should have started with this. Here's the depth. So the vehicle went down to 180 meters, and it held its depth during all of this process, and then it did some other measurements going deep and coming back to the surface. Okay, and here's the, the, some of the uh, activity of the sampler here. You actually see the flow rate through the filters. So in this case, we took 16 samples. We actually took 16 times two because we had we were getting replicates. So as as the animals were rising to the surface, Mesobot was sitting somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure what the scale is, but it was sitting somewhere in the layer that they migrate through. Okay, uh, and in 15 minute intervals, it was filtering, pumping, and filtering the seawater. So what we're hoping, and we don't have the results yet back yet, but that we can actually witness the migration through the environmental DNA, which is, I think, pretty, would be pretty fantastic. At the same time, uh, we also had a profiling camera called the Digital Autonomous Video Plankton Recorder, and we were getting these wonderful microscopic images 
of of the animals that are that are that are living there. So you have shrimp and gelatinous animals and green snow and all these copepods, of course. Um, uh, and so we're getting all this data, and uh, that's still being uh, crunched and processed now. But uh, we're, we're uh, we are awaiting those results with uh, great anticipation. Okay. Well, you'll find out that people like Alan and Adams and myself, we're kind of obsessed with the light in the twilight zone. Okay. And why is that? And that's because the light drives the dial migration. Okay. And the dial migration is complicated and it's mitigated by many factors. Um, and remember, I'm the robotics engineer, so I'm not the expert on dial migration by any means, but um, I certainly get to talk to a lot of people who are. Um, uh, the, the, and what, what you need to know that the the relevant levels of light are extraordinarily low, okay? The, the light levels that the animals are following um, would appear to be pitch dark to us, okay? We're, we're literally counting photons to, to emulate that. Um, and actually direct measurements of, of the irradiance at depth of the downwelling light um, are, are, are pretty scarce. It's been done, it's been actually done um, uh, certainly since the 70s, um, perhaps even before then, but um, it hasn't been done routinely. And and with Alan's new instrument, it's being done at least as well as it has ever been done. And it's a lot more, uh, a, a lot, the sensors are a lot easier to use. So what we want to do is we want to follow isolooms with the mesobot. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about why we would want to do that. But isolooms, of course, are levels of constant light. And so if the animals are basically maintaining a constant light level. So they're driving up and down to uh, follow the light. So during the day, they're down deep and at night they come up. But, but to them, they're staying in a kind of constant glow uh, circumstance, okay? Uh, so we want our robot to join in on the largest migration on Earth, okay? Um, and because we think that the, that the, oops, I got a miss typo there, sorry. Um, uh, um, you know, the animals are following these constant light levels. There are, there are other uh, ideas about what they're actually doing. For sure, they're at least triggered by the light. Whether they're actually following the light levels, that, that's, that's a, a bit of a hypothesis. But in any case, we want to make our robot do the same. As we're watching these layers going up and down on the sonar, we want Mesobots to join in that so it can make observations within those dynamic layers. Well, what do we need to do that? We need a sensor with extraordinary sensitivity and dynamic range, just like the eyes of the animals. We need control algorithms that can think like those animals, that can basically reason on that information. Um, and let me just say that an algorithm like, if it's too dark, drive up, if it's too bright, drive down, um, that would seem like it would work, but trust me, it doesn't because the relationship between the light level in the ocean and your depth at any given time is highly nonlinear. And if you've ever tried to make a control system, all the, the basic constructs that we use uh, are basically, many of them are for linear systems. So we have to be smart. We have to understand the physics and we have to make our control system accordingly. Um, and of course we need a robot that can be finely controlled and that doesn't disturb the animals. And we talked a little bit about that with Mesobot. Just so you know, Mesobot can control its depth to about six millimeters. Uh, I would say control the pressure to about six millimeters. So it, when we say it's at 180 meters, we mean it's at 180.00 meters, okay? And it can creep up and down under very fine control, which is important. That's sort of the base layer for the isolum following. Okay, now our inspiration from this comes from uh, uh, a colleague of ours, Edie Witter, uh, and she did some work with uh, Tamara Frank about 20 years ago, where they used a submersible and a wonderful sensor that they had then to follow isolooms and pretend they were a shrimp, okay? So they actually migrated in the submarine uh, using feedback from the sensor and the pilot driving the submarine. And that's how they were able to understand how fast the isolooms went up and down. So, so they pretended they were a shrimp, okay? Uh, and this is a wonderful piece of work. Um, and so Alan and I have been um, emulating that. We're trying to do what uh, Edie did 
uh, 20 years ago, only we're trying to do it much more routinely and in an automated fashion. Okay, the challenge. We need a fantastic sensor to do this. And this is a little bit um, a busy slide here, but um, the, 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 the ambient light levels vary over tremendous 11 orders of magnitude between a clear sky at noon and a cloudy night. Okay, 11 orders of magnitude, you know, that's like, I don't know, more than a trillion, I think. 100 trillion, maybe? One part in 100 trillion? Okay, and if also, if we, if we hold the light constant and we look at how it changes with depth in the ocean, it's 12 orders of magnitude dimmer at 900 meters than it is at the surface, okay? Allen sensor can't do qu quite that, but it can do at least eight, orders of magnitude, which is pretty good. And here we, so this is some of the first data we got. The vehicle was at uh, 300 meters, and and here is the, the light level that we're measuring. And then the vehicle went all the way down to 650 meters and came back up, and the sensor was working great the whole time, except you might say, gee, what's that's, your sensor's kind of noisy. What are all, oops, I'm sorry. I'm using the pointer on the wrong thing. I'm looking over here. So if we look over here, so we were at 300 meters and, and we were measuring the level of light. And then the vehicle went down to 650 meters. This was about noontime. And sure enough, the light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But what, you know, what, is the sensor noisy? What's going on here? You got all these spiky and ratty things in there. Well, when you look close, it's not spiky and ratty things. Those are animals flashing with bioluminescent light. And, and that's what's going on. So we're actually witnessing the bioluminescent flashing animals. And we can look at a couple of those. Um, like, um, for example, a firefly squid. Isn't that an absolutely incredible picture? That's from Dante Fenolio. I take no credit for these images, by the way. Uh, these are made by wonderful photographers like Edie Witter. Um, lanternfish, okay, one of the most dominant vertebrates on Earth has lights in its nose and lights in its belly. And dinoflagellates, which are way smaller than these animals, okay, they are extremely bioluminescent. And so most animals in the ocean, in the deep ocean, or maybe not most, but like 30 or 40%, according to uh, some of the experts, um, can ma manufacture light, okay? So we're, we're going into a bizarre world where like most of the animals are fireflies. Uh, I said this one thing. Imagine if you went out in your backyard at night and most of the animals or 40% of the animals were like fireflies. <laughs> your backyard would be a pretty fantastic place, wouldn't it? Well, that's, that's what the Twilight Zone is. Okay, so here's Alan's radiometer. It's a wonderful thing. Six decades plus of dynamic range. Um, it literally can count photons. But we need to play some tricks to make sense of it. We have to filter out that bioluminescence if we're gonna use it to control the vehicle so we can make the vehicle participate in, um, uh, in the migration. Remember, we want Mesobot to join the migration. We want it to follow the light levels like the animals do. Okay, so we actually went to Bermuda. This was um, about a year into COVID. So I'll, I'll spare you the details. That took a lot of work by a lot of people to make this happen. Went to Bermuda. We brought our own boat. We shipped it down on a cargo ship, if you can believe that. Um, and I can tell that story some sometime. Uh, you might think it's like carrying coals to New Castle, taking a boat to Bermuda. But this boat has a lot of very special instrumentation that we need, and that's and also it's run by a very skilled uh, uh, couple of people. So that's why we brought it. Um, and here's the Mesobot in its, the environment it was meant to work in. And we also tested some other uh, carbon flux instruments, like this is the Twilight Zone Explorer, which is my colleague, uh, Ken Bissler's sensor. Here we see the Mesobot working with the catapult in the beautiful clear waters of Bermuda. And we're working in something called Station B, uh, which is uh, another one of Alan Adams' creation. It's a virtual uh, technology development center set up in an old America's Cup uh, yacht, uh, warehouse uh, in Bermuda. So that was a fantastic adventure. We got some wonderful data on that trip. Um, again, uh, I'll walk you through some of these. 
Uh, first of all, let's start with the depth, okay? So in this case, we're starting at about 400 meters and Mesobot went down to 700 meters, stayed there and came back up, okay? The surface part, that's what the sunlight that we were measuring on the surface. So this was in the early afternoon. And so overall, the sun is, um, you know, getting slightly dimmer, okay? And the clouds are coming over. That's why you see these bumps in the data. But what did we see at depth? What was the light that we measured at depth? And again, here you see um, the, the, the data from the radiometer. And remember, this is a log scale, okay? So in this data, uh, the values are varying by about three orders of magnitude. So by it's a thousand times dimmer here than it was at the beginning, okay? And then we see all this wonderful fuzz, which we know is not noise, because if we blow it up, we see it's those bioluminescent an animals lighting off, okay? What a fantastic uh, thing to witness. And, and then you see this red curve here, that's the value that we stripped off that we think is the not flashing value that we'll, we'll use to actually control the view. So, um, okay, uh, you know, it's, it's bad to have equations after dinner, but basically, the downwelling irradiance as a function of depth falls off like an exponential, okay? And that's how you get these orders of magnitude decrease as you go down, okay? Um, and the problem is that the attenuation constant uh, is not, it's not, it's an attenuation coefficient, I misspoke. It's not a constant. You know, the, the water clarity varies as a function of depth. So, uh, uh, even if you even if, if you look at this equation, you need to take into account the fact that the attenuation um, uh, is not constant. Okay, so how does our isoloom following robot actually work? Okay, well, uh, we, I told you about the depth control in the vehicle is really good. If we tell the vehicle to go to a certain depth, it'll get to that depth with better than a centimeter, okay? Um, and here we have the actual dynamics of the ocean here, right? We've got the surface irradiance that goes through this equation here, and we get the actual irradiance at depth. So this is the light level at depth. So we tell it what, what light level to go to, uh, and we tell it what light level we're at. And there's some nonlinear magic in this block here that takes care of the fact that, that um, uh, there's there's a lot of nonlinear effects going on. And we use a classical control technique. Um, I didn't invent anything to do this. There's no machine learning here. This is uh, something called feedback linearization, which is widely used um, to deal, to sort of undo the nonlinear relationships. This is a perfect problem for that. So, okay, time for a C story. Um, and uh, so we're at Bermuda. We got this isoloom working, uh, isoloom following working. We got two days left, and uh, we're going to take Mesobot out and throw it in the deep ocean and watch the isoloom following work. We get offshore, it's too rough. The captain of the boat says, no, we can't launch here. We drive all the way around Bermuda. Here you see Bermuda. We drive all around the island trying to find a place with deep water where the seas are calm enough that we can launch. We can't find a place. So while we're out on the boat, half of us are seasick. I wasn't, but, um, and, and I gotta tell you, seasickness and COVID wearing a mask, let's just say we're not going there. Um, uh, it's unpleasant. Um, so, uh, so we said, well, what can we do? How can we, how can we prove that we've got everything working? We can't do the deep water. So somehow between our group, and none of us even remember who, who came up with the idea, which is how the best ideas actually are. We said, well, what if we go into protected waters here, which are very shallow, you know, so we're not doing that deep ocean thing, but maybe we can test our algorithm in here. Okay, well, that's a great idea. We said, well, the problem is that the radiometer is way too sensitive for that. Even, even at night, it's going to be saturated. It's going to be overwhelmed by the amount of light because it's made to work in the deep ocean. So Alan, who's here in this very flattering portrait I gave you, says, I'll build an attenuator. He took a Illy coffee can and some material from some garbage bags and taped it together. And he said, 
I think that'll work. And we put that on the sensor and it actually worked. Um, so we were able to attenuate the light so that even though we were near the surface, we could test our algorithm. And that first night we did a simple test and we proved it was working. The next night we did a much fancier test, okay? And um, so again, here's the light at the surface. So what's this telling us? It's getting dark, okay? At the beginning, it's somewhat bright and then the sun is setting and finally the surface sensor, can, it's so dim that the surface sensor can't even measure it, which is kind of like for our eyes. So, and these are half hour blocks here. So for the last hour, to our eyes, it was just dark. That's all we could see, okay? But the Mesobot and its radiometer was seeing something much different, okay? So what we told it, we invented a program while we were out there. We said, go down to eight meters, which was sort of the mid-water point in this shallow water environment we were working. We said, and follow the light level, and then pop to the surface, tell us you're okay, and go back and do it again grab whatever light level you see at eight meters and follow it pop to the surface go back down and we did that 15 times or something okay um now what was going on and you see that uh, as the light was getting dimmer the vehicle would rise faster during its little test period and at the end when the isolooms were really uh, rising quickest it was actually the vehicle was rising way quicker and if you look at the desired level of light that the vehicle was commanded to follow, that's the red values. Uh, and the blue values are what it was actually, um, uh, the, the, what, the, what the actual measured value was. So it was following the, the ambient light level extremely well. Um, and it did that over, if we look, here's 10 to the zero, okay, and here's 10 to the fourth. So we did four plus orders of magnitude of ambient light level. We were able to show that the vehicle can follow isolooms like a vehicle. Now, this is just an engineering test. There was no scientific value in what we did, but we showed our algorithm, the sensor, the algorithm, all, the whole software chain was working, which was really pretty cool. Okay, now we got to do this for real a couple months later. We were off the coast of California working on the EV Nautilus. And the first time we tried to tell Mesobot to follow an isoloom, it was actually after we had done a really, really good sampling run. Uh, it was fully dark by then, but as circumstances would have it, we had a gibbous moon. So about two thirds full moon and nature was kind enough to give us some clouds to come back and forth. So the ambient light level would change, okay? And again, if we look on the uh, depth plot here, which is, oops, I lost my first, here we go. So here's our depth plot. So we told Mesobot to follow, to go to an isoloom, and here's the depth. So it was down a bit deeper and it said, oh, it's too dark. I'm gonna rise up. And then it found the light level that we asked it to, and it held that light level. Okay, this is moonlight. It's actually following the moonlight. And then we told it to go deeper and to follow the moonlight again. Okay, and it did. And it was making relatively small corrections to its depth, but it was actually holding the light it was seeing constant as we imagine that the animals did. And then what's going on here? This looks very busy. Well, we're turning on the video lights so that we can see, we can see with Mesobox cameras what's there. So this was really pretty cool. And it doesn't interrupt our, our isolating following algorithm. And that's, that's kind of a good trick that we came up with because normally if you have a sensor that can measure these tiny, tiny amounts of light and you turn your big bright video lights on, <laughs> your, your algorithm's not gonna be very happy. So our, act, our algorithm actually knows when the lights are being turned on and it ignores the sensor and it just keeps uh, moving at the same pace. So we actually have a pretty um, a, a pretty elegant way of dealing with that. So what we can do now is we can follow the isolooms and we can periodically turn our lights on and see who's there, which is very important. Okay. Um, and, you know, this is just a goof here. I 
got to cite Ella Fitzgerald in a technical talk. Uh, we were, I got to say, this was a moment when all this was happening. I was running from the control van. I was watching what the vehicle was doing. I was running outside on deck, watching the moon. It was just an amazing thing. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great moment. All right, then we actually did something that was closer to emulating the animals. Um, we actually followed an isoloom just after dawn, okay? So as the sun was rising, the animals were all retreating down into the deep ocean as the, as the, the, the light levels rose. So Mesobot did the same thing, okay? Um, here you see the depth, this is the green trace. We turned on the isoloom following here, as the and the top plot shows the surface light. Okay, so this was the ambient light from the sun on the surface, and you see, yay, the sun's coming up. Okay, um, and then you see the vehicle going down because it's trying to hold its light level constant. And sure enough, if you look on the bottom plot, the red is the value it was trying to hold, and the black is the value that it actually held. So you know, it's not exactly perfect, but we were very conservative with how we had the algorithm set up and we showed it, it worked. So Mesobot was following the light levels down. Unfortunately, we weren't following quite a dim enough value on this uh, because we got in the water a little bit too late. So we're gonna do better next time, but, but this shows that it's all working. Mesobot can follow the light levels as do the animals. Uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Okay, well, uh, we'll leave some time for questions here. Uh, a lot of people to thank uh, on this uh, pro these projects, uh, you know, funding from National Science Foundation, NOAA from our uh, Audacious Ocean Twilight Zone project, our friends at Station B, the folks who operated the vessel for us in Bermuda, um, working with Ball Robert Ballard's gang at uh, uh, Ocean Exploration Trust at the University of Rhode Island, uh, my virtual co-PIs, I mentioned uh, Annette Kovindarajan and Alan Adams. Um, they are now, they are, when we're out at sea, they're connected in with us through the internet, through our phones, through text messages. Uh, they are literally participating in the expedition with us. Okay, and of course, the folks who do all the real work, which is our Mesobot gang um, and our students, uh, and also Alan's, Alan Adams uh, folks at Oceanic Labs who built the sampler and the radiometers. Uh, and one of our other uh, uh, friends, actually a former student and postdoc, uh, Jordan Stanway. So, uh, and here we all were in Bermuda posing with our masks on appropriately. Um, and so uh, let's see, I'm gonna show you the, if I can remember how to do it, sharing uh now i'm forgetting how to do this you go to your show button in the drop down menu and then you select the video okay i'm, I'm clutching in the sharing menu yep in the sharing menu there's a button that says show it looks like play and there's yes. that drop down menu ah uh, yeah here we go okay Good. Hey, we're there. <laughs> Sorry. Is that not working? The portion of the webinar cannot be viewed on your device. Are, you guys aren't seeing a video, are you? No, we're not. Oh, well, that was just a, a kind of really cool uh, video to end things. Um, yeah, and let, me, um, let me see if I can take over and show it from my side. Oh, wonderful. All righty. Um, so uh, I guess we have some time for some questions. And, you know, one yes, of the problems with these Zoom things is, you know, uh, I'll tell everybody a little secret. When you give talks like I do, one of the things that you keep track of is how many people in your audience fell asleep. <laughs> now, now that we're doing all this remotely, we don't know. So um, if there are no questions, I guess I'll just uh, assume that everybody fell asleep. But um, we, we do have some questions, but I do okay. want to show your video, too, because it's a great video. 
Okay. Um, which one do you want to show? Do you want to show the supplement movie or the drone footage? The drone footage. Show the drone footage. That's going to work. Okay. Let's see if that works. Oh, I'm getting an error too. Oh well, okay. We we can we can we can do without the video. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's it is kind of cool. It shows the Mesobot uh, being launched uh, just before dawn, so it was pretty cool. But anyway, um, uh, let's take some questions. Can I go to the chat? Is that how we do in the questions? No, um, I can read them. Uh, they're coming okay. through the question box. I'm just trying to get this. <laughs> work yeah i don't know why that you know hey everybody we did practice it it worked um the other video worked but anyway all righty let's have a question or two okay let me see all right thank you for so much for that presentation and we do have a lot of questions coming okay in. oh great Good. So people were awake. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had a question about um, AI, and I yes. seem to remember you saying that you weren't using AI well, in, in that in that one algorithm. Okay. Okay. We we, we uh, where where the there there are a lot of opportunities for uh, advanced kind of AI techniques in a vehicle like this, and I'll tell you what they are. They're not for the more straightforward tasks. Follow the isoloom with the without being confused by bioluminescence. That's more of a classical control kind of problem. Okay, the tracking of the animals, that's very much uh, a, an advanced kind of AI problem. And we're making that better and better. The ultimate AI problems for the vehicle are things like a mission that doesn't say, go to this depth, go to that depth, turn left, turn right, but a mission that says, Go explore the ocean, please. Okay, that's uh, that's not the kind of thing that I'm trained in, but fortunately, uh, our students and some of my collaborators are. So the whole idea of autonomous exploration that a vehicle with no human operator attached to it can go off and find things that are unique and special and then examine them in the way a scientist, the way Larry Maiden would if he was actually there with his scuba gear on, that's very much an AI problem. Perfect. Thank you. Um, question from Robert wants to know if um, Miso, Misobot uses GPS when it comes to the surface for uh, to find its it, location. It, it does. It does, but not for not for. Um, it does to help us find it. It has a, a beacon on the top that has a satellite phone and a GPS. And let me tell you. When Mesobot comes up far from the ship and you're not sure where it is, and you get that phone message that says it's right over here, that is a really <laughs> cool thing. Okay, the unit that we have, it actually says, you know, it's at it's at bearing 065 and it's 1.2 kilometers away, and we're like, oh, thank you very much. And I'll tell you, when you're when you're in a small boat in big waves off Bermuda and you're maybe getting a little panicky that it's kind of hard to find the vehicle and that message comes in you are very happy um so yes we it does have gps on it but only at the surface right did uh has there ever been a time when you haven't been able to find me uh well that would have been no because um we have we have three different ways of locating it on the surface okay we have that gps uh, iridium beacon okay we have uh, a vhf radio which is just like a marine radio except that we have a direction finder version of that so when it comes to the surface it starts beeping okay um but but th that's not nearly as good as the gps but it's way better than nothing okay and yeah. finally we have three strobe lights on it not one <laughs> not two we have three because i'll tell you if you're trying to find something on the surface of the ocean at night i don't care you got GPS, you've got radio beacons, you've got anything, nothing beats a flashing light. So we have three of them, okay? Um, yeah. Perfect. 
Um, Frederick wants to ask what's next for Mesobot? Well, we want to get back to doing the tracking work, you know, that we, we showed. We did a demonstration of that. We want to put that to work for science, okay? Um, and, you know, working with our Stanford and Bari colleagues, uh, we want to make it better. And we want to really follow migrating animals. You know, we talked about we can follow the overall migration by following the light levels, but then we can also track individual animals. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in that. And, and, and that's very much in the future. And of course, the eDNA sampling, that's working quite well. Um, uh, but, but we're certainly going to continue doing that as well. Great. And then um, a question about um, any sense of the impact um, to the surrounding organisms as Mesobot moves through the water column. Uh, it, it's, it's, I can't claim that we don't disturb things at all, okay? Um, we probably disturb things less than almost any other vehicle I know of, okay? But it's not zero. Um, well, I think that when you see the marine snow in front of the vehicle as we're hovering, you can see some small disturbances in it. Um, one of the ways that we're going to characterize that is um, by the bioluminescence. So uh, if we turn the lights off and we hover or we power all the thrusters down, we'll be very interested to see uh, whether we make more animals flash uh, as we do different things. And we'll try to adjust what we do to minimize that. Uh, the greatest thing would be if we, we could control Mesobot's buoyancy so that it didn't need to use the thrusters at all and it could just hang in the water. That would be great, um, but we're not quite there yet. That's great. Um, there is somebody, I'm going to unmute their mic, um, that would like to say hi. Oh, okay. Uh-oh, who's this? Mm. Let's see. I'm probably going to get the name very wrong. Struan? Stru? It's, it's uh, Robbie in Bermuda. We uh, tried to meet up when you were visiting last year and didn't quite get down to uh, Station B. Oh, okay, great. Well, you know, uh, we we had a, you know, it was COVID and things were a little crazy. And okay. normally we, 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 uh, we would have uh, been much more socially engaged than, um, than than we were so uh the good news we we got there we did good work and we got home and nobody got sick but i regret the fact that we weren't able to um sort of participate more in the larger community in bermuda because of circumstances you just have to come on back and make sure you bring a net with you too okay we will um <laughs> and um uh we did do some stuff with the public with the schools uh in in bermuda and, that was good. That was, that was really worthwhile. Thank yeah. you. Good luck. Okay, great. You bet. That's great. Um, any other questions out there? Um, Robert had another question about sensors that came through. Um, so he's wondering if you use any photo multiplier sensors. Well, we use um, actually uh, the the uh, we're, we're working on a paper. <laughs> in which case, I could send you the paper, but it's not quite done yet. Um, the sensor, the radiometer uses a SPAD array, okay, not a photomultiplier sensor. Um, certainly, the kind of classic uh, uh, original irradiance measurements going back into the into the um, into the uh, back in the 70s, um, those used photomultiplier tubes. And in fact, a lot of our optical communication systems still use photomultiplier tubes. Okay, but Alan selected this uh, SPAT array for the, um, uh, which is an all solid state sensor, of course. And, um, you know, uh, it's a little, it's, a, it's easier to deal with than the, than the photomultiplier tubes. But the PMTs are still around and they are still used very much, especially in optical communications. Next question. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to multiply. Let's see. 
Uh, we have a lot of um, <laughs> uh, we have another person who would like to say hello. Okay, who's that? This is Alan. Oh, Alan. Hello. Hey, Alan. Hey, Dana. Uh, great <laughs> talk. <laughs> well, I hope I didn't butcher your, your good work uh, too badly. Are you kidding? It was beautiful. No, and also, uh, I'm pretty sure it was your idea to, to go shallow and do the eight meter thing. That was a great one. Okay, um, well, you know, as I always say, the best ideas are the ones you can't remember who had them, right? It's, it's uh, nice to be able to blame you for that one. It really worked out well. So, so uh, it, my question is, is very selfish and self-serving. Um, when's Mezabon going to LumCon? The dialogue is going to be... LumCon. Yeah. Well, let's work on that. The, the dia... You know, it, it, unfortunately, our, our current, you know, you know, I hate to say it's about the money, but the, the funded cruises that we have are not taking us to the Gulf of Mexico. And I, I very much regret that. So um, I have a great affection for the Gulf of Mexico, um, having worked there uh, before, during and after the oil spill. Um, and uh, I have a lot of friends down that part of the world. So I would love to uh, take Mezabot down there and maybe we could go out on the Pelican or whatever. Um, and uh it would be it would be great so we you know we got to put our shoulder to the wheel we got to raise some money we got to well we got to come up with the science ideas to drive it that's actually the fun part okay uh and then and then we need to go get them dollars and make it happen hopefully dr roberts was listening <laughs> yeah yeah Oh, um, I gotta say, you bring me a bot to Lumcon. I'm not uh, sure yeah. you would and, do that. And, and, and those of you, you know, maybe who are just getting started in this field, I always tell everybody, you know, you think the hardest part is, you know, building a robot and putting it in the water and, and doing science experiments with it. That there, That's hard. Okay. Uh, getting your chance to do that by writing successful proposals and working your way through, um, you know, the funding system uh is just as hard okay uh as it should be i guess i can't i shouldn't complain about that but um you know if if we can get a funded effort you know we can we can make that happen and of course we work, work on that together right we, we come at it from the science from the technology from the operations side and we we uh we make a compelling case and we find the right funding source and we make it happen well, let us know what you need. Lumcon's happy to help you out. <laughs> okay, great. great. <laughs> Although I want to touch it. Uh, Patricia <laughs> would like to know where Mesobot is right now. Oh, it's somewhere between Woods Hole and Honolulu. Okay. Last, last, because uh, we're, we're going to be getting on the Ballard's Nautilus um, in uh, the 1st of May. Uh, and we shipped it out uh, just about a week ago. Um, uh, we shipped it out on Friday. Uh, last I heard, it had made it as far as California, uh, and it'll be air freighted from California to Honolulu, uh, and it should get there uh, very soon. And then we will meet it uh, on Monday, I think May 2nd, and we leave the dock uh, May 6th for two weeks offshore out of Honolulu. So. Stay tuned and you can follow us. I, I should put in a plug. You can follow us on Nautilus Live, okay? If you know about that. If you just Google Nautilus Live, okay? Uh, and, and we're gonna be operating Mezabot. We're gonna be operating another fantastic vehicle from, from, um, from Woods Hole called Nereid Under Ice. It obviously won't be under ice off of Honolulu, but it has some fantastic capabilities. And also working with a surface robotic vehicle called Drix that's operated by our friends at the University of New Hampshire. And one of our goals is to get all those vehicles, uh, as I like to say, singing and dancing together. Um, so we have the ship, we have a surface robot, and we have two subsea robots, and hopefully um, they will sing and dance some harmonious tunes together. Um, 
and we have a bunch of science experiments built around what those systems can do uh, working together. So. Perfect. I'm going to try to get the link to Nautilus, Nautilus Live in the um, yeah. email that will follow this talk. So. Oh, that's great. So you'll you be able to you'll be able to follow us. We're leaving the dock May 6th, and um, we'll be doing any number of outreach events. Um, and uh, and also remember we have that link. Uh, the link is used for engagement. Okay, it's also used for our collaborators ashore. Okay, so uh, Alan and Alan Adams and Annette Govindarajan, they they are you know you know we're a gang of three on this cruise and uh, we work together um, and uh, we work uh, and we work. We have the Nautilus has a whole bunch of really great things to promote interaction between uh, scientists ashore and and the, and the people at sea. So we want to take full advantage of that uh, on this trip. Perfect. So everybody who is out there um, and has attended, you'll get that link in the follow up email about uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so I think with that, we're going to call it a night. Uh, Alan, I'm sorry I put you on the spot there. Okay. <laughs> it was great, right. to, great to hear you. Um, and so I, this is a great talk, and I appreciate your efforts in advancing ocean science and learning more about the midwater twilight zone and just being a really awesome scientist. So. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, for the participants, thank you for attending our science talk. We have another one coming up and you can uh, find out who the speaker is and date uh, for that on our website at lumcon.edu forward slash science dash talks. Um, and we have a great lineup coming up for the rest of spring and we hope that you can make more of our talks. Right. And let me just thank everyone at LumCon for their virtual hospitality the, the last couple of days while we're getting ready for this. It's been great. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone.